Bueno, pues muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a este programa de webinars organizado por iniciativa de CIATEG y de Peace Corp México. En este espacio, pues el objetivo es discutir y reflexionar un poco sobre las tendencias en la innovación tecnológica que pues presentan retos y desafíos para la sociedad en el presente y en el futuro. Dentro de este programa de capacitación y colaboración se presentan tres seminarios. Este es el, el del día de hoy, nos, en, en este día nos encontramos en nuestro segundo seminario, en el cual el día de hoy abordaremos dos temáticas. Los casos emblemáticos de la ley de patentes, Landmark Patent Law Cases in Biotechnology, y con la temática también de CIATEC y las invenciones en México. CIATEC and Inventions in México. Para ello contamos con nuestros siguientes invitados. Por parte de Peace Corps México, al ponente el doctor Robert Mackenzie. Welcome Robert. We are very grateful to have you here again in this your second virtual conference and we really enjoy the first one. También nos acompaña la maestra Alejandra Navarro Hurtado eh, por parte de CEATEG. Muy buenas tardes. Y buenas si me tardes. permiten, me voy a eh, permitir a presentárselos a la audiencia. I'm going to introduce you both briefly. Okay? Well, eh, Robert is PhD in Neuroscience and Psychology. Uh, from Princeton University. He was visiting assistant professor from Texas A&M and also open, uh, University of, of Pittsburgh. He was also associated professor at Wayne State University, dean representative to the VA Research and Development Committee and OEPR Administrative Patent Committee. Bob has uh, 16 years of research experience at the pharmaceutical industry working on patent products, uh, technology transfer, startups, attracting venture capital, and he is currently a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, también eh, la experiencia de la maestra Alejandra, ella es responsable de la oficina de la propiedad intelectual de CIATEG, es ingeniera industrial con maestría en administración de empresas, más de 17 años de experiencia en propiedad de, eh, intelectual ha recibido capacitación por el INPI, por el OMPI, la Oficina Europea de Patentes y también la Escuela de Leyes de la Universidad de California en Davis. Además de eh, capacitaciones y certificaciones eh, dentro de la temática de transferencia y comercialización de tecnología por The Transfer Institute. Eh, y bueno, en CIATEC se dedica a la parte de protección de invenciones en el área de biotecnología. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. Thank you to be here. Let me explain to our audience that this webinar will be divided in two sections. The first one will be, will be held by Robert and the second one for Alejandra Navarro. And we have uh, 10 minutes for question and, and answer for each section. Okay. Then, um, le pedimos por favor a toda eh, nuestra audiencia que vayan escribiendo sus preguntas en el chat para poder eh, irlas eh, pasando a nuestros speakers. If somebody have any question during the presentation, please feel free to write and use the chat. Okay? Please, Robert, the screen is yours and you can turn on your microphone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank everyone for attending today. Uh, this series of webinars are being presented by the uh, Virtual Service Pilot Program, that's VSPP. And this is a <clears throat> Peace Corps program designed to promote technical and cultural exchange between the US and other countries. And the program director on the Peace Corps side is Paolo Cabero from Mexico. And the organi organizer on the uh, side of CIATEC, so this is between Peace Corps and CIATEC, this particular uh, project, uh, is Angela Suarez. And we will be in the different webinars 
joined by members of the Office of Technology Transfer in CIATEC. So there are three webinars. We've had one on September 14th on intellectual property. Today's is going to be on landmark patent law cases in biotech. <clears throat> and then on October 14th, we will be having a workshop on the importance of the innovation process. So landmark patent law cases in biotechnology. The um, three cases that we're going to, or three situations that we're going to talk about today are Diamond versus Chakrabarti, uh, done in 1980, and then AMP, or Association for Molecular Pathology, uh, versus Myriad Genetics in 2013. And then we will discuss the battle for patents in the uh, CRISPR world. So first let's start with Diamond versus Chakrabarti, US Supreme Court, 1980. So intellectual property rights are granted by central governmental institutions. The rules and regulations for intellectual property are set by these institutions in the US, for example, is the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and in Mexico, INPI, Instituto Mexicano de la Propiedad Industrial. And these institutions grant patents or they could deny patents and they also hear if people feel that their patents are being violated, they can hear those cases as well. And if anyone doesn't like the decisions of these organizations, then they can take those decisions to court. They can take them to a federal appeals court or ultimately, at least in the United States, they could take them to the Supreme Court. And these individual decisions made in these courts can determine not just the fate of individuals or companies involved in the case, but also can determine very important, have very important consequences for society as a whole. So the first one involves this individual, Ananda Chakrabarti. Chakrabarti is a, uh, uh, from India. He was educated in India <clears throat> and he got his PhD in University of Calcutta in 1965. And then he did a postdoc in microbiology at the University of Illinois. And in that postdoc, he studied the degradative pathways for complex organic molecules in the bacteria Pseudomonas. So he learned that these bacteria can actually eat oil. That is, they could degrade the components of crude oil and produce harmless metabolic byproducts. And he also discovered that the genes for these uh, enzymes that are required uh, for these metabolic pathways to work were not incorporated into the genome of the bacteria, but rather existed outside the genome in plasmids. And he was very interested in, in working in this area. In 1971, he left academia and joined the General Electric Comp Company, which seems odd because General Electric is a big industrial corporation that makes 
all kinds of things, kitchen appliances and televisions, um, X-ray machines, MRI machines, jet engines. Why hire a microbiologist? And, uh, and that is, uh, the reason for that is that GE at this time was thinking of getting a little bit into bioremediation, that is using biological processes to clear up uh, problems in the environment. And Chakrabarti uh, became a member of the research team there with some other microbiologists, and he was assigned to various projects. But while he was working on these other projects, he continued to work on his big interest, that is using uh, bacteria to clean up uh, oil spills. And eventually in his spare time, uh, Chakrabarti created uh, the superbug. And the superbug was simply combining a bunch of different plasmids that existed in different strains of Pseudomonas into one superbug. So now this superbug would be able to <clears throat> degrade camphor, degrade octane, degrade xylene, degrade naphthalene, all of these things in one bug, and it would be more powerful, a more powerful um, uh, method of bioremediation than previous strains of bacteria. So uh, this is the simple idea that superbugs would convert oil spills, the oil, the crude oil, from oil spills into harmless metabolic byproducts. And uh, the superbug worked quite well in uh, testing in the lab. And this was a good time for this kind of invention to come along because at this time, there were more and more uh, problems with tankers, there were more and more oil spills at this time. And uh, there was one major oil spill every year. In 76, there was 7.7 7 .7 million gallons. Uh, 77, 81 million gallons. 78, 68 million gallons. 79, 1979, 140 million gallons and another one of 46 million gallons in that year. So oil spills were, be, were becoming more and more common. And this was a good time to bring forth an invention that might do something to clean up these oil spills. So Chakrabarti was about to give a talk at a conference on the superbug, uh, but a vice president within GE told him, no, this is not academia. This is a, this is a corporation. We don't give talks so much as we, we first patent our inventions and he should go see a patent lawyer. So he went to a patent lawyer. And the patent lawyer had no experience with biological products. He's only worked with, with these big industrial products of GE. But to him, an invention is an invention. And he didn't see why, he didn't think there would be any problem in, in getting a patent for a Chakrabarti superbug. So for him, it was just another innovative product, toasters, ovens, light bulbs, jet engines, superbugs, why not? So this lawyer who had no experience in biology consulted with other patent lawyers in biological fields and they told him he could never do this because you cannot patent living organisms in the United States or anywhere. It just wasn't possible. And that patent lawyer didn't understand exactly why they could never tell him exactly 
why they couldn't give him a good reason. And he thought, was this a real law or was this a, just a belief? And the belief that living things could not be patented went back to 1889 when someone had wanted to patent fibers that they had extracted from pine needles. So it's a natural product from pine needles. And the US Commissioner of Patents at that time said they could not do it because pine needles were exist in nature. You can't patent something that exists in nature. He said any more than you can, if you find a new gem or a jewel in the earth, you would be entitled to, to have patents for all the gems on that earth. It would be unreasonable and impossible to allow patents upon the trees of the forest and plants of the earth. But this was just a statement from the US Commissioner of Patents who rejected this patent. There was no law that said you couldn't patent living things. <clears throat> the fact that you couldn't patent living things became known as the product of a nature doctrine. So that the idea was that processes that are devised to take out a natural product can be patented. But objects, the natural product, the natural things of nature themselves were not inventions and therefore could not be patented. <clears throat> and if you remember in the last, uh, in the last seminar, there are four categories of legal subject matter. That is the four categories of patentable products. And these are process or a machine or a manufacturer or a composition of matter. And the lawyer for GE thought, well, we have a process. The Chakrabati made these microorganisms, these superbugs, but it's also a new composition of matter. And so it should be both process and a product. And they decided to patent the superbug and the application claimed both the process of making the superbug and the product itself. And the patent, patent examiner said, well, this, this is a new process. Yeah, we, we can allow that, but we cannot allow product a patent on this, this organism because of the doctrine of the non-patentability of products of nature. So GE appealed this claiming that it wasn't a natural product. You could not find superbugs in nature. This required human intervention to make these superbugs. Then the USPTO board agreed that superbugs are not natural, but rejected the superbug because it is alive. They argued that if patents could be granted to single cell organisms with extra plasmids, so they might be given for multicellular organisms, even including human beings. For example, if you put in a new liver into a human who needed a liver transplant, you couldn't patent that person. So GE appealed to the Court of Customs saying that there was no law. There was no law that existed that prohibited patenting something specifically that was alive. And the board agreed and the solicitor appealed again, and the board this time decided even stronger that a patent could be given to the, to the, uh, for the superbugs, but 
Then the U.S. Commissioner of Patents, Sidney Diamond, decided he didn't like that decision, and he decided to take this issue to the Supreme Court. And so a Supreme Court case was held, and there were many organizations that supported Chakravarti's case. There was a patent law association, big pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, the University of California, <clears throat> Genentech. Genentech had uh, come out of, it was a startup company out of the University of California. And it was the first really successful big biotech business in the United States. And the American Society for Microbiology, there were a lot of people on Chakravarti's side. So the case went to the Supreme Court and the court said yes. Can something that is alive qualify as patentable subject matter? And the answer was yes, but look at how close the decision was, five to four. So it is yes, it was decided in favor of Chakravarti. Dissenters were afraid that this was opening up a whole new area of uh, products that could be patented. And they thought that maybe Congress, a legislative body, should be making this decision and not a court. But the those on the, uh, on the yes side decided that that's what patents were all about. They, they should be able to open up new areas of technology. And so Chakravati won his decision. Uh, and the comments on the decision were very strong. The court ruled that patents could be issued for anything under the sun that is made by man, this is a very strong position. That is, if, you, if, if, if it's man-made, some man-made intervention, then uh, that is a patentable product. And uh, the Chief Justice said that the relevant distinction is not between living and inanimate objects, but rather between naturally existing and human made inventions. So if a life form did not exist in nature, but a human organized that life form, life form in a different way, uh, that now is a new product and can be protected by a patent. And Genentech, the bio company, the biotech, the new biotech company, agreed with the Supreme Court and said that this decision assured the country's technological future. Of course, other people were not so happy. There was always a give and take on these decisions. Some people saw this as the beginning of creations of all kinds of new different life forms. And they, they, saw, they thought that there was perhaps a grave danger to society. But as far as the uh, superbot was concerned, it was considered that they were designed to solve practical problems. They are a product. Therefore, they needed protection from competition and protection comes from intellectual property rights. So Chakravarti got his, got his um, patent. The court decided in 1980, he got this patent in 1981 and he was, he was very happy. And he's, he's been considered in a way, uh, one of the founding fathers of biotechnology in the United States because of this case. This is a little cartoon that goes through the whole story showing Chakravarti at, the, at GE in his lab, and then the Supreme Court making the decision. And this saying that the event is marked as important because it set a precedent for the ability 
to patent organisms that have been genetically modified. It still caused a lot of problems. People are concerned about what this might mean for the environment, but nonetheless, many uh, new genetically modified organisms have been patented since the 1980 court decision. That is not to say that the controversy has stopped. People still argue about what should be allowed and what sh shouldn't be allowed in terms of uh, using genetically modified organisms in the world. For example, if we look at uh, genetically modified crops, you could see that there are lots of regions in the dark brown here are regions that make heavy use of genetically modified crops. The lighter brown area like Mexico, Mexico here and other countries show uh, a fairly good usage of uh, genetically modified crops, but there are many regions of the world where this is still uh, not allowed. And so, you know, the, the decision was made, living things can have patents, but then whether they are approved for use, that's another matter. And that falls in the realm of regulatory agencies uh, and different countries have different views about what is to be allowed and what isn't. And uh, well, sadly, uh, uh, Ananda Chakravati just recently died. He died, well, about a year ago today. And uh, in fact, his superbug was never used to clean up oil spills. The, the hybrid pseudomonas that he made were not stable. And uh, even today, it's still, it is still not allowed to release a genetically modified microorganisms into the environment. It is true that bacteria are used to eat, oil eating bacteria are used to eat oil spills, to clean up oil spills, that these are mixtures of naturally occurring bacteria still to this day. Again, it shows the difference between getting a patent and then being able to use your invention. Again, that step depends on regulatory agencies. So that's uh, Chakravati. The next case is AMP or Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics. And this case involves a diagnostic testing for breast cancer. So the BRC1 and BRC2, BRCA2 gene, are genes that play an important role in repairing DNA when it gets damaged. And uh, if the BRCA genes are themselves damaged, they can't do their job and the unrepaired DNA can in turn uh, lead, to, uh, lead to cancer. And typically breast cancer, although uh, the BRCA genes one and two are also uh, involved in ovarian cancer and pancreatic tumor growth as well. BRCA or BRCA simply comes from breast BR cancer, CA. <clears throat> so these two genes, BRCA1 and BR BRCA2, one on chromosome 17 and one on chromosome 13, they are uh, the genes, obviously, they encode for proteins. The proteins are very different from each other. They're different in size. They're totally different in amino, amino acid sequence, um, but they are involved in the same pathway. 
So both are tumor suppressors. Losing their function promotes cancer and they help repair double strand breaks in DNA. And they are in the pathway that complicated pathway uh, that involves homologous recombination as the repair mechanism for double strand break. <clears throat> so this is the, the pathway for homologous recombination for double strand break repair. You can see that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are both involved in this pathway. These genes are important um, and uh, BRCA gene mutations in cancer are clearly related. Individuals, if you carry a mutation, and you live to be 85 years old, uh, you have a 80% chance of having of breast cancer. Um, if you live to be 70, you have a mutation in BRCA1, this is the chance of having breast cancer. Uh, in BRCA2, this is the chance no mutations in either one of those, only a 12% chance of having uh, breast cancer. So it's clear that, you know, people would like to know where they are in this situation. And also it is the case that early detection can save lives so that uh, reliable and uh, cheap Diagnostic testing is required. So uh, this woman here, Mary King, Mary uh, Claire King from UC Berkeley uh, was a geneticist and she was the first to show here in 1974 that breast cancer uh, is an inheritable disorder. So just by looking at family, the occurrence of breast cancer in families and uh, doing the history of the family, she was able to determine, yes, indeed, there is a uh, inheritability to this disease. <clears throat> and then 16 years later, with, uh, in collaboration with several other researchers, she was able to uh, show that the BRCA1 gene resided or existed on chromosome 17 in a certain region of chromosome 17. And so when she did that, the race was on. There was a big race, international race, of various labs to find the sequence, to find the gene for BRCA1 within this region of chromosome 17. And the winner of that race was uh, this fellow here, Mark Skolnick from University of Utah. University of Utah had uh, produced a startup company called Myriad Genetics, and Skolnick was the head of the Myriad Genetics Company. <clears throat> so Myriad wins the race here. Th this is the paper that uh, uh, Mary Claire King uh, published to show that uh, the uh, BRC1 gene occurred on a region of chromosome 17. And this is the paper in which uh, the Skullneck lab uh, published the sequence in 1994 uh, of the um, BRCA1 gene. <clears throat> well, the BRCA2 
gene was discovered in 1995. This was, a pa this was the paper by the Michael Stratton lab from England in, in London that showed the uh, sequence for the BRCA2 gene. But the day before this paper was published, the day before it was published, the Skolnick lab announced that they had the sequence for the BRCA2 gene. So they scooped Stratton. And uh, therefore, the Skolnick lab, which meant myriad genetics, had uh, both BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they had uh, spent, myriad genetics had spent $500 million tracking down BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they felt that unless they could get a patent for these genes, they would never be able to recover that initial investment. <clears throat> so after winning the race to sequence uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, Myriad Genetics obtained patents on the gene sequences and methods of using them as diagnostic tests for cancer. And these were very broad uh, interlocking patents covering genomic DNA, cDNA, methods of diagnosis, all kinds of things. And it was very, a very aggressive patent. And this is a very aggressive business model. So instead of having the, the uh, patent protection and then making money by licensing out the use or the study or whatever of BRCA1 and BRCA2, Myriad shut down BRCA testing everywhere for competitors, for clinicians, for researchers. So no work now could be done on BRCA1 or two. And because Myriad had a uh, monopolistic patent position on this, they, they prevented any competitors from existing because if anyone was going to use these genes to diagnose someone for BRCA1 or two, they would be immediately sued by Myriad because now the, the landscape was clear. Myriad had no uh, competitors. They had a monopoly. They were now charging $4,000 for a, what they call the B, BRC BRAC analysis, BRC analysis. And from 1997 to 2013, this company sold about a million tests and generated $2 billion in uh, revenue. Now these tests prior to these patents, these types of tests typically cost around $100. But Myriad now with the monopoly position was charging $4,000 and many health insurance uh, companies did not uh, cover the cost of these uh, tests. So this was a bad position here. Myriad is saying that there, these were their genes and other people uh, thought that uh, differed, did not agree. And so the patents were challenged by competitors, lots of different groups, clinicians, diagnostic testing companies, researchers, lots of people got together and formed the Association for Molecular Pathology. And this group, AMP, challenged uh, the US 
Patent and Trademark Office, they said that Myriad's patents should be invalidated. And they, the Patent Office agreed. They said that, um, that's right, these genes are just products of nature. But Myriad immediately appealed the 2009 decision and took it to a higher up court. And that court decided in Myriad's favor. They said that they could uh, have a patent on the genes because they isolated the DNA. And isolated DNA does not occur in nature. And cDNAs were also useful. And cDNAs certainly do not occur in nature. So at this point, then AMP took their case to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court asked, can Myriad patent the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes? And the answer was a resounding definitive no. It's very rare to have unanimity, a unanimous decision on the Supreme Court. But in this case, the court decided nine to zero that they could not. And the ruling was that basically, you know, a natural product is a part of the laws of nature. Laws of nature, natural phenomenon, abstract ideas, you cannot patent these. If you discover a new mineral in the earth, for example, if you discover gold, you cannot patent all the gold that they're eating. It's a naturally occurring uh, product of nature. Likewise, laws, Einstein could not patent his law of E equals MC squared. Newton could not patent the law of gravity. <clears throat> Such discuss, discuss, discoveries are manifestations of nature, free to all men, reserved exclusively to none. So this was a, a major decision. It ended the era of monopolistic genetic diagnostic testing. And so again, the further statement by the Supreme Court that patent protection must strike a delicate balance between creating incentives that lead to creation, invention, and discovery and impeding the flow of information that might permit indeed spur innovation. The decision is not a move away from patents in general, but from ones that block innovation. Myriad had blocked innovation into BRC1 and BRC2 genes into the genetics of cancer. Their patent on the genes was not upheld. So let's look at the battle for CRISPR. What's going on with CRISPR? <clears throat> so what is CRISPR? CRISPR is short for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. It is a bacterial innate immunity system. And it gives the ability to make double-stranded cuts in DNA at precise locations in DNA. Now DNA is a huge molecule. There are 3 billion base pairs in the human genome, for example. The length of chromosomes, human chromosomes, differ from 50 to 250, 50 million to 250 million base pairs. And so being able to, if you know the full sequence of 
a genome, being able to make cuts anywhere you like opens up the genome to many types of important manipulations. And since DNA is the blueprint of life on this planet, CRISPR allows for the precise manipulation of life itself. So uh, this uh, CRISPR was discovered by Francisco Mojica and also others in different parts of the world, of Europe. Uh, Mojica is from the University of Alicante in Spain. And in 1993, he made a very uh, important observation. He recognized, he recognized that within the, the genome of bacteria, uh, many bacteria shared a common set of features and he called this the CRISPR locus. And these, what he noticed within the CRISPR locus was that there were these very short repeats, these, uh, the same sequence again and again and again and again, but they were separated by short spacers. And surprisingly, the DNA of those spacers was not bacterial DNA, but was DNA from bacteria phage that is viruses that attack bacteria. And so uh, Mojica correctly uh, suggested that CRISPR may be an adaptive immune system that bacteria <clears throat> use. And that's exactly what it is. So this is a picture of CRISPR. If you look at, here's a bacterial genome. Here's the CRISPR locus here. And these black boxes here represent the repeats. They, they all have the same sequence, the palindromes. So they read from, from this end to this end, e, from either direction, the same as well. But these are the same sequence here, is here, 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 here. Short palindromic repeats. And then there are these spacers, and these spacers have DNA from bacteriophage. This one, for example, has the DNA from this red bacteriophage here. <clears throat> so this whole locus is known as the CRISPR locus. And when bacteriophage attacks the uh, the bacteria. This CRISPR locus is transcribed and then cut up uh, into separate spacer uh, uh, repeat units. And these then are also hybridized to another RNA that's transcribed, a tracer uh, CRISPR RNA, and these two hybridize. The CRISPR, the uh, tracer RNA hybridizes to the uh, repeat part of the uh, CRISPR locus. And then this is the part that's complementary to, uh, to the bacteriophage DNA. Now in this condition, this allows this complex to, to complex with a protein, Cas9 in this case, and then these two together can search out using the complementarity of this sequence for a complementary sequence in the invading DNA of the bacteriophage. And that's important because this enzyme here this is, uh, this is a single enzyme. These different colors here just show the different domains of the protein. It's a single protein. 
this um, <clears throat> uh, protein is important because it is a endonuclease. It can cause double-stranded cuts in DNA. And so this mechanism allows this endonuclease to be guided to a target, which happens to be DNA from an invading bacteriophage to inactivate the, uh, the uh, inactivate the uh, bacteriophage DNA and stop the attack. So you can see that it's a simple matter how one could maybe reprogram this system to work in almost any DNA situation. If you know this, know the sequence of your target DNA where you want to make a double-stranded cut in that DNA, then you can devise, actually you can make just a single long RNA molecule that is partly complementary to your target DNA. And if you have the appropriate RNA here, this will activate or complex with Cas9 if you can express Cas9 in your cell as well. And that complex will go to your target DNA and make a double-stranded cut. This just Cas9 uh, is a 1300 amino acid protein and has many different important uh, domains within it. Again, it's inactive. It, it gets expressed upon a bacteriophage uh, invasion as well, um, but it uh, is inactive until it forms a complex with the guide RNA. So this, this um, had all been worked out the CRISPR components, exactly how all of this is this worked, was published in a paper by um, Jennifer Doudna and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. And uh, this was published in 2012, a programmable dual RNA guided DNA nuclease in adaptive bacterial immunity. And they <clears throat> they basically published a method here of how you could use CRISPR in any organism to make a cut anywhere you want the DNA. And shortly after that, there was published a paper by Feng Zhang from Harvard or the Broad Institute, which is part of Harvard and MIT. This paper essentially used these techniques, but they said, uh, but they, they said that they were the first to show that these techniques work in a eukaryotic system. So all of the work, all of the experiments that had been done to figure out how the CRISPR system worked had been done in prokaryotic cells or in vitro, whereas Zhang says that um, he was the first to use it in eukaryotics. Even though in this paper, they say that it should be able to be used in eukaryotics, they do not demonstrate that that is the case. So what can you do with a system like this? Why is it so important? Well, again, you can direct you can make cuts anywhere you want in the DNA. You can replace, you can put in a new DNA to correct, say, mutation in DNA. You can modify Cas9, different domains in Cas9, so that it only cuts, it only nicks one strand, only nicks the DNA by cutting one strand or another. And this allows you to make the targeting of the CRISPR system 
even more precise. Or you can, you can kill the Cas9, you can inactivate its en enzymatic activity, but just let it find the gene of interest and bring along, say, a gene activator. So if you target, say, a dead Cas9 to a promoter region of a gene that you want to have a higher level of expression, then you just make a, a polygenic expression vector that expresses a dead Cas9 plus an activator, a transcriptional activator, and uh, you will now activate that particular target gene uh, specifically. The same could be done for a repressor, same could be done for using uh, just to mark the gene with a, uh, say, a GFP marker. So many important things can be done to manipulate. So you can knock out, you can knock in, you can correct mutations, you can <clears throat> repress, you can activate, you could do even more. Very, very versatile system that has revolu revolutionized the ability to work with DNA. And it has been, uh, people have uh, realized how important this is. So uh, it's enabled, a, it's a simple and affordable way to manipulate and edit DNA. So also it's very easy. Researchers are walk, working on new ways to cure diseases such as cancer, blindness, sickle cell disease. <clears throat> and uh, they're using it for a wide variety of methods, producing biofuels, improving food crops, uh, engineering genetically modified mosquitoes to prevent dengue and malaria. There are many, many, many uses uh, of this new technology. So it's extremely valuable. <clears throat> and the Nobel Prize uh, realized how valuable this, this was. And the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 2020 was granted to uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna uh, for their discoveries uh, using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genetic excuse me, genetic systems. Again, they worked out the, the methodology for, for using CRISPR. And uh, it's already been put to a successful <clears throat> medical use. Uh, this is uh, Victoria Gray here. Victoria has uh, sickle cell disease sickle cell disorder. Uh, this is a very serious, very painful disorder. And it's caused by mutations in the beta globin gene, which is a, a gene whose protein beta globin is expressed uh, and it forms a large part of the of hemoglobin, red blood cells. And mutations in this gene cause the protein to uh, form in a different way. And uh, the formation, the differential formation of the protein causes a, a different differential formation of the red blood cell itself. And the red blood cells get sticky and they get uh, malformed and they can sometimes clog up and impede blood flow to various areas of the body, and it's very painful. <clears throat> but luckily, humans and other mammals have another hemoglobin gene called fetal, fetal hemoglobin. Uh, this operates before birth and is shut off after birth. And the fetal hemoglobin gene is shut off by a suppressor gene 
which can be knocked out by using CRISPR, the CRISPR technique. So there's a new FDA approved approach to do autologous uh, uh, bone marrow transplant. So one donate their own bone marrow cells and have these bone marrow cells treated with CRISPR to knock out the suppressor of fetal hemoglobin, which is not mutated and to restore normal health to the individual. And this has now been done successfully in, in a growing number of patients in the United States. And now new patients are also being treated not to just release fetal hemoglobin from suppression, but also to correct the mutation in the adult hemoglobin gene. So this is just one, one example of the utility of um, <clears throat> CRISPR. Now, there are some dangers. People are worried about this can be taken too far. There are future ethical considerations about designer babies and, and all of that. And we will have to see you know, how we deal with these situations in the future. But currently there is a problem in the CRISPR world, and that is that there's a fight over who has the patents for CRISPR. So uh, in May uh, 2012, Doudna and Charpentier and the University of Vienna, because of another scientist, they all they, together, they filed a provisional patent of how CRISPR-Cas9, how that system works as a gene editor. And they said that was good for how it works in all organisms. But the, the Broad Institute, Feng Zheng, MIT, Harvard, they filed a patent for the use of CRISPR-Cas9 system in eukaryotic cells. And they paid an extra little bit of money to get an accelerated examination so he can do that. So Zhang, or Zhang was granted a patent before uh, Doudna. So Doudna submitted an interference challenge, which says that uh, Zhang is basically uh, using something that they have already claimed in their provisional patent. And uh, they want the Zhang's patent to be dismissed based on obviousness because they had already worked out the, the system, and they said that it would be good in, uh, you, in, all, in all organisms, plants, mammals, uh, bacteria, whatever. <clears throat> well, the US Patent and Trademark Office decided in favor of Jean. They said that the patents were actually different. They were not overlapping. What Zhang did was not obvious because he had to add a few little things like a nuclear localization signal and other things to, uh, to the uh, Cas9 protein. So Dauda then appealed that decision and lost again in 2018. So this is already now like six years after the initial patent uh, was uh, filed. <clears throat> and then in 2019, finally, the US Patent uh, and Trademark Office grants a patent to Berkeley and Charpent Charpentier and University of Vienna for their work. So that is, 
they granted a patent for how CRISPR works in all organisms, but they did not take away Zhang's patent. So that was just, you know, the previous back and forths here had determined that the patents, the subject matter of the patents were in fact different, but, and they each have granted patents now, but Doudna is now uh, challenging priority for this. Doudna is saying that they were first, Zhang was after and was obvious, and, and there are overlaps. And this is very confusing because if the new case, if the new decision now gives priority to Doudna, that must mean that there is overlap between the two patents. And it would directly challenge the previous court decision on the fact that the patent subject matters were different. So this is just very, very confusing situation. This is continuing to date and no one knows exactly how it's going to end. Uh, nonetheless, companies have been founded based on various patents that have been issued. So uh, these companies have been formed off of the Doudna patent. These companies have been formed off of the Feng Zhan patent, the Harvard patent. And these companies have been formed after the Charpentier uh, patents. But it's difficult to know if one is wanting to use some of these and wants to license from one of these companies, who are you going to obtain the license from? And if you, if later on, these patents are taken away from one or the other, um, are you going to get sued by the other group? It's very confusing at the moment. This really needs to be resolved. <clears throat> There's a man, man Paul Conley, who's a uh, big venture capitalist and heads the uh, Paladin Capital Group. <clears throat> and his feeling is that scientists and also people who want to use uh, clinicians, et cetera, who want to use these techniques are living in terror. They want to know if they go down this road, are they going to get sued? And if they begin to develop a commercial uh, enterprise, are they going to have trouble raising money because of the confusion surrounding the patent situation? So it's this is confusing and is ca causing a lot of concern within the community. But um, nonetheless, you have this situation just July 2021, a couple of months ago, <clears throat> Caribou, which is a company using one of the Doudner patents, raised $304 million in the first day of one of gene editing's most lucrative initial public offerings. So people are still willing to bet on how these things are going to turn out. But at this point, it's all bets. Nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. <clears throat> Other people think that the confusion might have a good side to it because it pushes people to try to forget CRISPR and discover newer and better gene editing tools. So they feel like it's creating a pressure to go outside of CRISPR and expand our knowledge of how we can manipulate uh, DNA. 
So uh, it is the case also that in times of crisis, the rivals can actually put aside the battles over patents and work together. So you have both uh, mammoth biosciences and Sherlock biosciences uh, developing using CRISPR techniques, viral detection methods that can be used openly and without licensing to anyone as long as they're fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So for this use, these companies are suspending their patent rights. And that's, uh, that is an encouraging sign. But for now, the CRISPR battle for patent priority continues. And we will have to wait to see who the winner will be and how the decision will affect the use of this revolutionary technology. So in conclusion today, uh, I would say that the patent battles from Chakravarti to today have shaped and continue to shape the world of biotechnology. And that's it for today. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. It was really interesting, your information. And we will see if we have a question from the audience. There is, a, there is a lot of uh, information and, and I think it's uh, important to know all these milestones in biotech. Um, for example, I, ha I have a, a question about how um, well, it is important um, to, to patent just to protect the the technology for a disease as, 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 as a scientist, I feel that I need to resolve a problem. But behind, we have a business model <laughs> in all of these three cases. No? What is important for the scientist? What is important for industry? What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that it's important for both, um, but scientists uh, are stimulated by the idea that they are going to, you know, benefit from the patent protection. It doesn't mean that they have to close off everything in the area. They are protected from somebody using their invention for their own purposes and making a lot of money, but they are not prevented from allowing others to use the technology, to license the technology, uh, to make it freely available if people are willing to uh, spend some money to do that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong. I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Without the promise of being able to profit in some way, and especially when a lot of money has been spent in trying to make, come up with the inventions. In those cases, one expects some return on the investment and one can get that under a patent system, but it's important that one does not you know, take advantage of that. And um, in the terms of like the bio uh, pharmaceutical industry, it's clear that in many cases, the pricing of some of their drugs, I believe is just taking advantage of patents without uh, overdoing their monopoly position. Okay, good. And there is a... Uh, um a long way no? to, to do our research in the lab and they to um, go to the market. No? It's a long wait in biotech. 
in those. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ok. Eh, no sé si tenemos alguna pregunta por ahí. Los invito a, a que hagan sus preguntas en vivo si gustan encender sus micrófonos. ¿Alguna otra pregunta más? Okay, we have on time to take the second conference with Alejandra Navarro. Okay, Ale, eh, puedes compartir. Hola. Sí, esto ya. Muy bien. Bueno, pues primero que nada, Bob, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really interesting. And these three cases are, uh, are uh, beginning from everything in biotechnology and all, all the patents related. So I'm gonna try to explain a little about these cases in, in Mexico and how are the patents here in Mexico related to this kind of technology. But also I'm gonna talk a little about our technologies uh, and, and Ciatec technologies, how are they protected here in Mexico and how are uh, the protection from everyone uh, in, in Mexico. So I'm going to, to make the, my presentation in Spanish. So I'm going to continue right now. Uh, Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Alejandra Navarro. Este, como bien Ángela ya me presentó, estoy en la oficina de propiedad intelectual de Ciatec y les voy a platicar un poquito sobre, voy a retomar los casos que presentó Bob, que me parecieron muy interesantes en el campo de biotecnología y, y cómo los podemos estar manejando nosotros en México. Y bueno, para, para retomar un poquito sobre qué podemos patentar y no qué, qué no podemos patentar, bueno, hay que recordar que este, en México podemos patentar aparatos, sustancias y composiciones, este, procesos y los métodos de cómo lo hacemos. Sí podemos proteger cepas de microorganismos, de plantas y animales, siempre y cuando estén modificados o hayan sido aislados por nosotros y tengan un uso en particular, y ahorita lo voy a retomar. Y nuevos usos de aparatos, sustancias, composiciones o cepas ya conocidos también se pueden proteger en México, y sobre esto ha habido mucha controversia en, en el último año con, con la reforma a la Ley de Protección a la Propiedad Industrial, donde se hizo mucho énfasis respecto a los segundos usos que, que viene señalado particularmente en el TEMEC. Pero para que podamos proteger cualquiera de estos, es muy importante que recordemos que debemos de cumplir el requisito de que sea nuevo, y esto es que no exista en ninguna parte del mundo, o sea, que no lo hayamos publicado nosotros mismos, que tenga actividad inventiva, y esto es que no sea obvio para un técnico medio en la materia, sino que realmente haya requerido del intelecto de, de, de algún humano para poderlo trabajar. Y finalmente es que tenga una aplicación industrial y es que sí sirva para algo que nos permita resolver una necesidad. Entonces, si nosotros cumplimos con esos tres requisitos, y tenemos una de las condiciones, este, un aparato, una sustancia, un proceso que habíamos mencionado anteriormente, tenemos la posibilidad de obtener una patente. ¿Qué no podemos obtener como patente? Bueno, en México no podemos proteger lo que ya existe como tal en la naturaleza, al igual que comentaba Bob, tiene que tener una modificación y debemos de haber hecho nosotros algo para poder este, reclamarlo como una patente. No podemos proteger razones que vayan en contra del orden público o la moral. Y esto quedó muy señalado en la nueva reforma a la ley. ¿Por qué? Por ejemplo, este, eh, en algún momento eh, se pudieran llegar a solicitar eh, armas que requieren de células de fetos humanos para poder hacer su desarrollo, ¿no? Entonces, en este caso, eh, 
no estaríamos atentando contra el orden público la moral y por eso no procedería, ¿no? A pesar de que sea un desarrollo este, por humanos que realmente requirió trabajo de los humanos, estaríamos atentando, atentando contra el orden público o lo moral, ¿no? El tema de la clonación también en México no es protegible. Este, los procedimientos que son esencial, esencialmente biológicos para la obtención de vegetales, sin embargo, sí podemos proteger cuando hacemos temas de micropropagación a partir de esta reforma a la ley, ya podemos proteger temas de micro, procedimientos de micropropagación para poder obtener nuevos vegetales o animales. Entonces, esta modificación quedó señalada en, el nuevo, en, en la nueva ley. Este, los métodos de tratamiento, y aquí entra lo del CRISPR-Cas, que, que es el caso que nos presentó ahorita Bob. Este, los métodos de tratamiento para humanos, animales o métodos de diagnóstico, como tales, no son protegibles. En México no podemos impedir que te den un tratamiento contra cáncer o que te den un tratamiento contra cierta enfermedad o que te puedan dia diagnosticar la enfermedad. Lo que se puede proteger son las herramientas, medicamentos este, desarrollados para combatir estas enfermedades o estos, o estos tratamientos. Entonces, eso sí pudiera ser protegido y de hecho ya hay varias patentes en México relacionadas con CRISPR-Cas. ¿Qué otras cosas no podemos pr proteger? Bueno, las teorías científicas o matemáticas porque son completamente abstractas, estas no se pueden proteger. Plantas y animales como se encuentran en la naturaleza, porque ya existen, es básicamente un descubrimiento, como lo mencionaba Bob, que si nosotros detectamos el oro, o descubrimos el oro, pues es un descubrimiento, ya existe como tal en la naturaleza. Los principios teóricos o científicos, por lo mismo de que son abstractos, descubrimientos, programas de computación, este, la presentación de la información y el cuerpo humano como tal, este, no podemos protegerlo, incluida su secuencia total o parcial de algún gen. Pero a pesar de que no son patentables algunas cosas, este, de, como nos lo dice el artículo 49 de, de la Ley Federal de la Protección a la Propiedad Industrial, las variedades vegetales y las razas animales no son protegibles, salvo en el caso de los microorganismos. Quiere decir que sí podemos proteger el microorganismo, si nosotros le damos un uso particular a ese microorganismo. Si ese macro, microorganismo, como el caso de Chakravar, nos ayuda a, 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 a dar un, una solución, o sea, le estamos dando una aplicación, podríamos proteger el microorganismo para esa aplicación en particular. O sea, le podríamos dar ese uso en particular. Este, entonces, ¿qué otra cosa...? Podemos patentar, a pesar de que este, nos dicen respecto a esto, las invenciones que sean este, objeto de un procedimiento microbiológico, lo que les decía de, de las plantas, este, sí se pueden proteger si son, es objeto de un procedimiento microbiológico o cualquier procedimiento técnico a un producto obtenido por dichos procedimientos. O sea, si nosotros estamos haciendo una modificación no estamos llevando a caso un proceso que naturalmente se ejecuta, sino que realmente tuvimos que implementar procesos y condiciones específicas. Podemos proteger este procedimiento este, y, y al final vamos a obtener el producto que, que estamos buscando. ¿no? El material biológico aislado de su entorno natural, por ejemplo, en Ciatec tenemos varias este, patentes relacionadas con cepas que son para la fermentación, este, de, de bebidas alcohólicas o para su aplicación para, para, para distintos usos, como para, también para la degradación de suelos contaminados, este, podemos tener la protección de ese material biológico que fue aislado de su entorno natural con un procedimiento técnico específico y puede ser objeto de protección, aunque ya existe en la naturaleza porque le estamos dando una aplicación específica. Entonces, lo importante es que sí podamos tener esa aplicación industrial incluso para secuencias totales o parciales de ácidos nucleicos. Tenemos que dejar muy en claro dentro de nuestras reivindicaciones de, pro, de la protección de la patente qué uso le estamos dando. Porque no nos van a dar la protección sobre la secuencia, sobre el microorganismo, sino nos van a dar la protección sobre su aplicación.
Y ¿Okay? sobre eso vamos a poder obtener la patente. Entonces, les voy a poner un ejemplo de una patente que, no, que Seattle tiene en México y que tiene licenciada a una empresa que se llama Ecosystem Beta y que está por sacar al mercado. Es un inoculante, es un, es un bio, este, biofertilizante que con, consiste de varias cepas y que estas cepas este, logran tener un mejor rendimiento en los cultivos. Esta tecnología fue muy atractiva este, y, y se empezó primero a probar en pepinos, luego se extendió a hacer las pruebas en otros cultivos y esto nos ayudó a proteger correctamente la patente. Si hubiéramos solicitado nada más los microorganismos, hubiera sido difícil este, de obtener la patente. Sin embargo, estamos soportando dentro de la memoria técnica del documento que este inoculante aplicado a pepinos, jitomates, y se ponen varios ejemplos dentro de la solicitud de patente, tiene excelentes resultados y nos da, nos da posibilidad de tener un producto mejorado y, y mejorar este, en la agricultura. Entonces, es por ello que podemos, se, pudo, se, se ha trabajado la patente y la patente ya está otorgada en Chile, en Estados Unidos, este, en Canadá, estamos en, en, ya también fue otorgada, estamos en proceso en México y en Europa, y ya está licenciada la tecnología a una empresa que es quien estaría, estará comercializando la tecnología en estos países. ¿Y por qué es importante? Bueno, todo esto que hemos visto, voy a platicarles un poquito de los escenarios. Este, les queremos platicar también cómo está la situación de las patentes en México. En México, el año pasado se, obtuvieron, se solicitaron 14,312 solicitudes, muy parecido el promedio a lo que se solicitaba otros años a pesar de la pandemia. Evidentemente, esto puede ser resultado de que la investigación ya venía trabajándose y los resultados se presentaron en el 2020. Entonces, en el 2021 podríamos ver una disminución en el número de solicitudes. Sin embargo, ¿cómo estamos? Bueno, somos un mercado muy interesante para, para muchos mercados, para Estados Unidos, Alemania, Francia, Italia. Ellos están protegiendo sus patentes en México. Los mexicanos solo estamos solicitando el 8% de las solicitudes. Entonces, quien está buscando ese monopolio temporal en México es... es, es otros, son otros países, no nosotros, ¿no? Patentes otorgadas, igual el año pasado, solo el 5% fueron de mexicanos. Estados Unidos tiene la mayor parte del mercado de estas patentes otorgadas y que están en proceso de, de su comercialización. ¿Y ¿Cómo se distribuyen? La mayoría de las patentes están relacionadas con, con medicamentos, que son artículos de uso y consumo, medicamentos, productos para para el consumo humano, tal cual, son como, como las que más se protegen y si se fijan en la tendencia, pues es, se mantienen, ¿no? Este, igual en las otras, también otras de las que están resurgiendo son técnicas industriales y que tienen que ver muchas cosas con temas de electrónica. En cuanto a cómo estamos en Jalisco, este, Jalisco es un estado que ha tenido un desempeño completamente diferente a, 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 al, al país. Eh, normalmente, eh, bueno, siempre ha sido el primer lugar Ciudad de México, siempre ocupa el primer lugar. Sin embargo, este Jalisco siempre ocupaba como el cuarto o quinto lugar en cuanto al número de solicitudes que presentaba anualmente. Desde el 2014, más o menos, 2015, se presentó un proyecto en, en Jalisco a través de la Secretaría de Innovación, donde buscaron impulsar el número de solicitudes y aproximadamente los últimos cuatro años, Jalisco se ha posicionado en el segundo lugar de número de solicitudes de invenciones y de patentes en México, este, considerando eh, que ha habido recurso por parte del gobierno para apoyar el, la las nuevas solicitudes, tanto en, en el pago de derechos como en el pago de despachos especializados para el ingreso de estas solicitudes. Y bueno, a lo largo de... De la historia de Ciatec, este, les platicamos que, bueno, Ciatec metió su primera solicitud de patente en 1994. En ese momento, los investigadores eran quienes iban directamente al INPI y buscaban, bueno, no existían, iban a buscar el apoyo para, para hacer la redacción de sus solicitudes. Este, durante varios años fue así, los investigadores lo hacían. Posteriormente se, eh, entraron abogados especializados en propiedad industrial para impulsar esta, el, 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 
el trabajo de los investigadores en, en el tema de redacciones de invenciones y apoyarlos en su ingreso, pero fue hasta el 2012 cuando ingresó una persona con, con expertise en el área técnica que les ayudó a impulsar un poquito más y a, a generar, a, a trabajar un poco más en el tema de, la, de cultura de, de propiedad industrial, así como nuestras metas en Ciatec, este se incrementaron y bueno, los últimos años han sido los años este, más con mayor número de solicitudes de invenciones. Lo que vemos en rojo, este, bueno, son las patentes que nos han sido otorgadas año con año y en verde las, las, los licenciamientos que al día de hoy podemos, contamos ya con 12 licenciamientos de tecnologías de CIATEG en el mercado. Entonces, ¿cómo se distribuyen nuestras invenciones de CIATEG? Bueno, tenemos estas áreas de, de estas unidades y líneas de investigación este, y así se distribuyen las más que más tiempo tiene, también la unidad que más tiempo tiene es la tecnología alimentaria, por supuesto es la que mayor número de solicitudes tiene, sin embargo, es, perdón, este, es de las que más tiene, pero sin embargo el área de biotecnología médica y farmacéutica, a pesar de que es más nueva, tiene aproximadamente 12 años, este, por la misma temática es más probable que podamos proteger su tecnología. Entonces, este, tenemos mayor número de solicitudes en el área de tecnología médica y farmacéutica. Si las distribuimos de acuerdo a nuestras sublíneas de investigación, donde más tenemos es en el desarrollo de productos con potencial terapéutico y en temas de alimentos y bebidas, son donde más tenemos desarrollo en temas de biocatalizadores por la, por la unidad de biotecnología industrial, también es muy sobresaliente, y las que menos... Este, Digo, que, que están todavía trabajando es ese tema de micropropagación, bioeléctrica, que, bioelectrónica, que es muy nueva, la sublínea en, en CIATEC, y este, el, este año ingresamos nuestra primera solicitud en este tema. Y bueno, que por ejemplo, otras patentes que tenemos protegidas es esta de, o es un suplemento de calcio, que busca, eh, con este desarrollo es mucho más biodisponible, entonces es más seguro que este, este calcio vaya a llegar a los huesos y no lo vayamos a desechar o vayamos a crear, convertirlo en piedras, ¿no? Entonces, este desarrollo está también protegido, ya se está solicitando su protección, ya fue otorgada en Estados Unidos y Canadá, este, en México, estamos pro, pro, trabajando la protección en China, Corea, eh, Japón y Europa, Japón ya fue otorgada también, perdón, y eh, eh, está licenciada esta empresa que se llama Antibomb Breaking, entonces esperamos muy pronto puedan, pueda estar el producto en el mercado. Parte de lo que platicaba Bob y preguntaba Ángela hace rato, bueno, finalmente la tecnología para que llegue al mercado en temas de biotecnología nos lleva un poco más de tiempo. Tendemos a proteger la tecnología en una etapa temprana porque los, los desarrollos, para, para poder continuar en el escalamiento y poder tener el prototipo, muchas veces tenemos que divulgar información con otras empresas o con terceros donde podríamos perder la confidencialidad. Entonces, es mejor que protejamos antes de realizar todas estas pruebas. Pero todavía lleva un tiempo para llevar al mercado las tecnologías. Es el caso de esta tecnología que todavía están haciendo algunas mejoras para que pueda estar ya lista para su consumo. Otra tecnología este, que tenemos protegida en Ciatec es un, un sistema de tracto digestivo humano que está protegida para su uso principalmente en CIATEG. Varios de los proyectos de investigación hacen uso de esta tecnología para poder probar que su producto este, está cumpliendo con, con las condiciones que estamos prometiendo. Es decir, podemos evaluar con esta tecnología exactamente en qué parte del, del tracto digestivo humano se están liberando ciertos metabolitos de interés para saber si puede generar este, gases o si puede este, ayudar o puede generar diarrea y es mejor no otorgarlo, ¿no? O, o, por ejemplo, algunas tecnologías que tenemos protegidas que queremos saber si efectivamente es liberado hasta que llega al, al colon, por ejemplo, el, el producto que estamos nosotros eh, tratando de, de desarrollar. Entonces, esta, esta tecnología es una tecnología protegida, también por Ciatec, tiene varias patentes y estas este, se explotan 
directamente en el centro. Y bueno, para finalizar, este, les quiero presentar esta otra tecnología que es una planta de tratamiento de aguas residuales, que esta tecnología la hemos transferido no de manera exclusiva, sino que se ha transferido a varias empresas para que busquen la, la construcción y, e implementación de plantas de tratamiento de aguas residuales. Esta, agua, esta planta de tratamiento tiene la particularidad de que eh, consume poca energía y además eh, de consumir poca energía, no expide olores fuertes. Entonces ha sido muy atractiva e interesante para comunidades pequeñas este, donde pudiera, pudiera ser instalada. Y bueno, esto es lo que yo les quería presentar, Ángela. Este, este, teníamos eh, poco tiempo, pero sí queríamos presentarles cuál es la situación de, de, de Ciatec y, y respecto de las tecnologías que presentaba Bob, pues cuáles son las razones de si podemos o no proteger. Entonces, CRISPR-Cas probablemente se va a estar solicitando. No sabemos cómo, va, cómo van a proceder las autoridades. Algo que me pareció muy interesante lo que dijo Bob es, es se puede otorgar para aplicaciones en específico y, y cada quien tendrá una aplicación específica y se la podrán ir dando, pero habrá que ver qué tanta libertad de uso tenemos para su aplicación. Entonces, ¿podemos proteger sobre algo que ya está protegido? Sí, si le damos una aplicación distinta o un uso particular que no sea obvio para un técnico medio en la materia, pero siempre tenemos que recordar que tengamos libertad de uso para su aplicación este, sin tener que pagar derechos o pagar los derechos adecuados a esa otra persona. ¿no? Este, en el caso de los microorganismos, pues sí los podemos proteger en México si le damos una aplicación particular a ese microorganismo o si lo modificamos genéticamente y le damos una aplicación particular, podríamos estarlo este, utilizando. Bueno, este, de mi parte sería todo, voy a dejar de compartir. Muy bien, gracias Alejandra, también bastante eh, complementaria a la información que nos dio Bob. Tenemos por ahí una pregunta de Andrés Méndez, si gustas Andrés, puedes abrir el micrófono para hacerlo directamente. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi pregunta es si una tecnología está patentada en otros países, pero no en México, ni con una solicitud internacional, ¿esta podría ser patentable aquí en México o se consideraría como no novedoso y por lo tanto no patentable? Este, es, eh, eh, si está protegido en otro país, ya te afectaría a la novedad. Este, entonces, automáticamente no la podrías proteger tú. Tendría que ser, solo que la otra persona lo, lo hubiera solicitado con una solicitud internacional, este, esa misma persona podría solicitarla en México si está dentro de un plazo. Pero efectivamente te afecta a la novedad. Si tú la quieres solicitar, esta tecnología está protegida en Japón y tú la quieres solicitar en México, pues a la hora que haga el examinador, el, la búsqueda de fondo va a detectar esa tecnología, te la va a citar y ya no cumpliría con el requisito de novedad. Entonces estaría, sería no factible. Gracias. De nada. Muy bien, ¿alguna otra pregunta? Pues yo tengo una. A ver. <ríe> Mira, sí. Si, um, ¿cuál, ¿Cuál ha sido, digamos, el, el éxito de Ciatej? En, en cuanto a, a, a número de patentes ya este, comercializadas. Y bueno, okay. si, si esto también ha sido difícil para el centro, ¿no? Uh -huh. Teniendo en cuenta que pues tenemos ya 45 años. Sí, bueno, teniendo en cuenta que tenemos 45 años y el número de invenciones que tenemos y el número de investigadores que tenemos, creo que los resultados han sido buenos, ¿sale? En promedio, la mayoría de las instituciones, este, incluso Stanford, MIT, no logran licenciar más del 10% de sus patentes. Nosotros tenemos licenciadas 12 al, al día de hoy, que me parece un número muy importante, muy interesante, este, de las 200 solicitudes que tenemos aproximadamente. ¿sí? Este, ¿qué, ¿Qué es lo que yo veo? 
hubo un proceso de cultura en el centro muy importante, que fueron los primeros años, donde primeramente luchamos contra esa, número uno, eh, poco conocimiento en el tema de propiedad intelectual que se tiene en México, este, y donde pues, lo tradicional es publicar ¿no? para los investigadores. Entonces, logramos ya brincar esa, esa brecha, eh, y ahora con los licenciamientos, a lo que nos hemos enfrentado es que todavía faltaba que algunas tecnologías estuvieran, fueran factibles de transferirse, ¿no? Algunas tecnologías se desarrollaron considerando condiciones de laboratorio que no son, no son escalables, ¿sí? Por ejemplo, si tú utilizas agua destilada en el laboratorio para hacer tu desarrollo, no es escalable porque en la industria no vas a utilizar agua, agua, a, agua destilada. Si los resultados no son los mismos que, que con agua potable, pues va a ser difícil de implementar porque el uso de agua destilada en la industria es poco probable. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que, es, que recomendamos y hemos este, visto que, que nos, puede, nos ha estado ayudando un poco más? Es considerar que desde la investigación... Eh, ya están considerando los investigadores y los estudiantes utilizar condiciones más cercanas a lo que necesita el mercado para que la tecnología sea, tenga mayores probabilidades de ser transferible. Entonces, creo que ha sido un proceso de aprendizaje muy bueno e importante el que ha tenido Ciatec y que ya tenemos los primeros resultados de las primeras transferencias donde estamos este, trabajando esto, ¿no? Entonces, este, no sé si respondí tu pregunta, Ángela. Sí, muchas gracias, Ale. Es también para que la gente que nos está escuchando, pues, eh, tenga mayor conocimiento. I'm going to include to Bob in this question because I'm going like to compare the environment, the environment in Mexico about the technology transfer, how it's happened in Mexico and how uh, it's happened in United States, for example, because I know that. Uh, Uh, United States University are uh, successful in technology transfer, but what happened in Mexico? And if we compare these countries? Yeah, I, I can. I, I don't really know what happens in the uh, in the universities in Mexico. I know that um, you know many of the universities have technology transfer offices, and the presence of those offices must mean that they are, you know, looking at all the labs and hoping that something interesting comes out of the labs, a new invention, and then they will take that invention and talk to the, uh, the inventor, the scientist, about what they should do with it. Should they patent it? Should they do a provisional patent? Should they do an international patent? So I think the process is the same. Uh, as far as I could tell. And, you know, as Alejandra said, that, you know, there are certain things that are patentable that are not patentable, that there, there are differences in the, in, the, in the countries, but there are also uh, very large similarities. Um, <clears throat> so I can't really say, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, how they differ, they, they might differ simply on how much money is being put into basic research. So the United States, a lot of money, uh, you know, does come from the government, but also a lot of money comes from business. And business funnels and supports research, and uh, they expect something in return, but, um, You know, it's, it's a matter of finances, I think, is, might be the difference. That, 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 that would be my, uh, my feeling of this. Yeah. Sí, para And complementar then... un poquito lo que, lo que comenta Bob, si definitivamente el tema de financiamiento es, un, es algo muy importante. Este, por ejemplo, aquí recibimos mucho financiamiento del gobierno para las etapas iniciales, pero ya no para, o sea, para escalar la tecnología, este, hay pocos fondos este, y, y requisitos son, son in, impresionantes, ¿no? A veces que es poco viable de llevarse o de poder conseguir ese recurso para continuar el desarrollo. Entonces, muchos desarrollos los tenemos en etapas tempranas, 
que no son transferibles a empresas que no tienen el recurso para continuar con el desarrollo. En México también nos falta mucho cultura. Yo considero que el tema de cultura de inversión en investigación y desarrollo, este, eh, digo, se necesita mucho apoyo del gobierno, pero también hubo un, un bache con la industria donde decía que si no había recursos del gobierno, no invertía en investigación y desarrollo. Y me parece que eso también ha afectado mucho en, en impulsar, ¿no? Este, también tenemos poca cultura de propiedad intelectual. La verdad es que solo los últimos 10 años se ha empezado a considerar a, a, dentro de la currícula de las materias de universidad, cuando en, en, en Estados Unidos lo ven desde antes, en Japón lo ven desde que están en la primaria. Entonces, eso también ha afectado mucho en cuanto a tener esa cultura para poder tener tecnología viable de protegerse y transferirse, ¿no? Creo que en temas de transferencia sí estamos todavía muy, muy verdes en México. Se está haciendo mucho. Este, la red OTT que ha agrupado a, a todas las oficinas de transferencia ha trabajado mucho en capacitaciones, en, en poder hacer alianzas para poder, poder impulsar esta transferencia. Pero no debemos olvidar que pues, va a haber tecnología todavía, que la tenemos a lo mejor ahí como invenciones, pero no es transferible por el nivel de desarrollo que tiene, ¿no? Este, y es un, un bache que tenemos que pasar, pero que eventualmente lo vamos a pasar. Se está trabajando mucho en esto. Este, cada vez yo veo más a las oficinas de transferencia trabajando en esto. Los CEPADs, los centros de patentamiento también. Estamos recibiendo mucha información por parte del, de, del mismo INPI eh, y de distintas oficinas, con lo que esperamos sí poder impulsar, capacitar cada vez más este, y poder... Eh, incrementar el nivel de transferencia, pero sí, todavía nos falta mucho. Como lo veíamos en los gráficos, pues simplemente solo el 8% de las patentes son de mexicanos, ¿no? Este, y, y son más las de Estados Unidos, este, como bien dice Bob, la, Be la ley Beidol que tienen en Estados Unidos también es muy importante, ¿no? Este, donde toda la inversión que hace, eh, que es la investigación que se hace en las universidades con apoyo gubernamental, pues la tecnología queda en las universidades, que son quienes administran y transfieren al final la tecnología y les permite tener un recurso de regreso para continuar con la investigación y desarrollo, ¿no? Entonces, creo que todavía tenemos muchos baches que brincar en México, pero vamos, vamos caminando bien. Thank you, Alejandra. I'm going to add uh, one thing, uh, human resource capability. Then, like entrepreneurs, for example, it's uh, mandatory for technology transfer. And uh, thank you for uh, all the comments. And Robert, Norma, if you have a final idea or conclusion, please uh, take the mic. Uh, well, you know, I, I just say that uh, you know, this has been fun giving these talks. And uh, you know, the, the first week we talked about, you know, what patents actually are. And then this week we talked about, uh, you know, how fighting for patents can influence the, the whole biotechnology industry and how either allowing or denying patents really, uh, have an important impact. What happens in the courts is very important. But I think that the main takeaway is that patents are there for, again, the two things that are important is justice and utility. So it's the, the justice is the compensation to give to scientists or companies for the time, effort, and money that they're spending to create new inventions. And the utility is to stimulate other people to spend their time, money, and effort on pushing further uh, innovation. And um, well, that's, that's basically the, the story. As long as that balance can be achieved, uh, I think patents, Play a very important role. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bob. Sure. The, 
de mi parte ya nada más este, agregar, digo, la, la información que nos presentó Bob fue muy interesante respecto a la situación de las patentes en biotecnología que es tan nuevo, ¿no? Y, este, y que ha tenido muchos, tendrá todavía muchas cuestiones que se van a pelear. Vamos a ver muchos pleitos legales en relación a esto, muchos temas éticos, este, y, y va a ser parte del proceso dentro de, de la patente, pero sí me parece interesante que sí debemos de buscar proteger las tecnologías para poder tener esa, esa compensación que nos permita continuar la investigación y desarrollo, seguir impulsándola y mejorándola y poder tener cada día más este, presencia y, y, y mejores desarrollos este, que nos ayuden finalmente a mejorar la calidad de vida que tenemos, ¿no? Muy bien, gracias a la audiencia por participar. Vamos a cerrar este webinar. Recuerden que este ha sido el segundo de tres webinars que se están haciendo, este, se están coordinando entre CIATEG y Peace Corps México. Los invitamos entonces a continuar con, con nuestros próximos webinars que van a ser anunciados en la página de Facebook del CIATEG. Eh, y agradecer. I'm grateful for your information, for your uh, your your uh, um, conference this day. It was very useful for all the for Thank all you. the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Gracias. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.